some stuff. <coughs> so naive pace, I guess. Okay, who's heard of naive pace before? So the reason why I'm covering it is twofold. First of all, it's a ridiculously simple algorithm. Secondly, to also demonstrate that you can use the tools, like these deep learning frameworks, to do other things than just neural networks. Okay. <coughs> so what's the key assumption in naive phase? Well, I'm assuming that you know p of word one to word n given spam factorizes nicely into p of wi given spam. Okay, straightforward. And so then, if I make this assumption, then p of spam given the words by base rule is just given proportional to p of spam times the product, right? The only thing missing, and that's why we have the proportional, is the denominator, and I'm going to be lazy and recompute the denominator afterwards. By just evaluating this right inside, p of spam times the product for both spam and ham. Actually, let's see this. Okay, so what we need to do, therefore, in order to train our naive base classifier are two very simple things. The first thing is we need to compute P of spam. Well, that's easy. I just look at all the emails that I'm getting. I count how many spam, how many ham I have. That's a pretty good estimate of P of spam. <coughs> and then I care about P of WI given spam, so I just look over you know, the number of times the word Viagra occurs in spam and in ham emails. And unless you're doing biological research, chances are it's a pretty significant feature. So the problem is if you have you know, a naive based spam, spam filter, the assumption is that you know, a lot of those things um, <laughs> will be of equal <laughs> probability. In other words, those phrases make absolutely no sense whatsoever, but since we are looking at individual word probability as well, okay, you get nonsense. So that should already tell you that maybe naive base is a little bit too naive. Um, so here's the graphical model, but okay, if, if you have never seen one, this is really just what depends on what is called a directed graphical model, you know, spam and then all the various words, given spam, so the assumption is that the uh, friendly Nigerian spammer sits at the keyboard and has a button for every word or that he will generate with a certain probability and the emails make no sense. <coughs> okay, have you ever seen this in practice? Okay, well, at some point there was a spam attack which would have a completely spammy payload. And then, in the last line or in the first line, there would be random keywords that were not very spammy at all, just sprinkled into it. And the goal of this was to utterly confuse the Neve base spam filter and make the email go through. And for a while it succeeded because basically that spam filter was utterly naive. Um, by the way, obviously, statisticians don't like drawing diagrams like the one on the left. It's kind of tedious to draw those circles, so they've invented their own for loop, and that's the one on the right. It's called a plate. So that just means for all i going from 1 to n, do this. Uh, things get a bit more interesting if you have two for loops that are interlocking. And then you can do things in stats that aren't so easy to do on a computer. Unfortunately, if you need to code it up, you then need to bite the bullet and deal with this. So for instance, for recommender systems, you have for all users, for all movies. But then you really only look at the interactions between users and movies. Anyway, this is just a short detour. Take a graphical models class if you're interested in this. It's pretty cool stuff that you can do. So. What do we have? Well, we have data, like emails, labels, and then maybe images. And we need to get those probability distributions. Uh, mind you, this is a gross oversimplification. This is just the header of an email, right? 
The text starts, you know, at the very bottom. Everything else up there is essentially metadata of what happened to this email as it was sent from the sender until it got to your mail host, wherever that may be. And all of this information is useful to figure out whether the email is legitimate. <coughs> so, how do we build our naive, very naive, naive base classifier? <coughs> well, we want to get the feature probability. In this case, I'm really go only going to care about binary. P of xi equals is true, given y. So I just count the number of times that this holds divided by the total number of occurrences. And that gives me the probability for feature i, and I do that for all i. I also need the spam probability, and then I'm done. Okay, sounds good. <coughs> Can you see a rather fundamental problem with this, besides the fact that the statistical assumption is horrible? Where could this go wrong? Yes? If you have no occurrences of a particular feature. Exactly. So if you have no occurrence of a particular feature, then you'll get the Dunning-Kruger effect equivalent of the naive base classifier, where the classifier will be utterly confident in something, uh, and it'll just say one or the other. Tra things get worse if you have one feature that always occurs and the other that never occurred, and then in on the test data, you have the reverse, and then you just get not a number, right? So you're absolutely right. This is when things can go horribly wrong. So what people have done, therefore, is they've just added the pseudo count to everything. They've just incremented all the numbers by one. This is called Laplace smoothing. And if you're interested in this, there's a lot of Bayesian non-parametrics, <coughs> Chinese restaurant processes, Dirichlet processes, and so on. So take a class of Jim Pittman's, and he will cover this in, I hope, a lot of detail. So there's even a process named after him, the Pittman Your Process. Um, yeah, um, we are going to barely scratch the surface. Now, <coughs> as I said, here's a very simple algorithm. You know, for all the documents, you know, aggregate the label counts aggregate the various counts and then we'll look at that in code, don't worry. So, but before we do that, for some, for so now for something completely different. And you wonder, you know, why that? Okay, so this slide seems to be utterly unrelated to what I just told you before. Why am I all of a sudden diving deep into floating point numbers, exponents, mantissas, and other things? Well, <coughs> the thing is, okay, so floating point numbers have, mm, that's why they're called floating point numbers. They have basically, you know, some part that specifies, you know, precisely, you know, what the value is. And then you have another term that specifies precisely what the order of magnitude is. The latter is the exponent, the former is the mantissa. And then, okay, you need one extra bit for the sign, but that's about it. So if you have, doubles, then you have 64-bit, and you know, life is good, and usually you don't get numerical <laughs> overflows or underflows. <coughs> if you have floats, you have 32-bit, and your mantis and your exponent shrink. That's still okay. If you have 16-bit, things get really awful, and then if you go to int 8 and int 4, and I'll explain to you in the next slide why this matters, um, you need to do a lot of tricks to make it work. Okay, so what are you supposed to do in this case? Uh, and by the way, so the place where it occurs is for instance, if you're taking products of probabilities. Each probability might look rather innocuous, let's say it's you know 50%, and then all of a sudden you get 100 of those numbers, and then you, know, you get two to the minus 100, which is about 10 to the minus 30. So things get awful very quickly. <coughs> and if you're adding things and normalizing and so on, you will get overflows, underflows, not a number, and your code will not run. So the culprit is that we are basically stuffing all the information into the exponent and the matisse is pretty much unused. So in other words, the trade-off in when, if, when the double storage format was defined is the wrong one for dealing with probabilities. <coughs> so what are, you, are we supposed to do? Well. It's actually not that hard. We just take logarithms. Now all of a sudden, multiple, 
multiplications become additions, so everything's great. The only thing we need to do is, <coughs> because when you multiply those, when, when you add probabilities, you need to exponentiate things and then take the log again, then things could go bad, right? So let me quickly write on the whiteboard what the issue is. We want to compute log of e to the a plus e to the b, right? Now, let's say a and b are in the order of about 100. This will give us horrible numerical overflow. So we get inf, and inf here, and log of inf is inf. So things went badly wrong. But what you can do is, you can immediately see that this is the same thing as a plus the log of e to the a minus a, so that's zero, plus e to the b minus a. Okay. This is potentially much better. <laughs> it's much better if b is less than a. If b is larger than a, I can still get my overflow here and everything goes wrong. So what I simply do is, I take the maximum of b and a, I pull that out, and I subtract it in on the inside again. Right? And this way, everything is numerically stable. Um, this is not just for deep learning, but also if you're doing graphical models and other things, uh, be very careful with this, otherwise, your code may actually not work. So why do we care? Well, because on GPUs, um, essentially the speed goes as follows. Every time you, ha you have the floating point or the numerical format by a factor of two, things get twice as fast. It's not entirely true because then there are also things like tensor cores that make things even more effective. But you can basically think of it this way, for a given bandwidth constraint, bandwidth budget, I can pack two or four times as many numbers into the same you know, amount of data that I'm sending into a processor. And mind you, it actually turns out that the amount of silicon goes quadratically with the amount, uh, with the number of bits that you need. So it's almost free to add lower precision uh, operations. So that's, for instance, why NVIDIA added int4 on their new uh, Turing GPUs, because it almost costs them nothing in terms of silicon, and they are probably hoping, who knows yet whether that bet will pay off or not, that by adding those operations, you can add some other, you can get an additional speed up by a factor of two for, my guess is probably one or two percent larger chips. And given that, you might happily take that speed up of two. So your task might very well be to figure out which algorithms can take advantage of this. There's still some papers to be written. Okay, so now that we have this, 